All right, welcome everyone to uh, the NeuroTheory Forum, uh, restarting after the, the holidays. Uh, I hope you're all safe and well. Uh, my name is Andrew Sachs, and this series is co co with Google. And we're very lucky today to have Professor Michelle Insanali. Um, Michelle is an assistant professor uh, at the University of Pittsburgh, and she's done a lot of fascinating work. I um, think some of her early work on critical period plasticity has really interesting parallels to deep learning and sort of unsupervised pre-training. So if you haven't read that stuff, um, I would very much encourage it. Uh, but today she's going to be talking about uh, neuronal dynamics. Um, sorry, I had the... Maybe it's been a title, slight title change. <laughs> Neuronal dynamics of non-classical, classically responsive cortical neurons. And just before we get started here, a uh, few notes. You can ask any questions you have, uh, clarification questions in the chat box. Um, and maybe an audience member will be able to help you or I can pose it to Michelle. And if you have broader questions, you can use the ask a question functionality. And at the end of the talk, we, we can pose those. Uh, if you want to come up on screen to ask your question, just note that in the question when you ask it. And finally, um, after this session, we'll have plenty of time for questions, but after all of that, we'll move to a Zoom room for a more informal discussion. Everybody is welcome, um, wherever you are in the world. We hope you'll join us. Uh, you can come to listen, discuss, ask questions. Um, so please do join us. We'll send the Zoom link to that out near the end of the talk. Uh, and so with that, over to you, Michelle. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Can you see my slides? Can you just let me know? Yes. OK. Yeah, always good. OK, wonderful. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, and hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and perhaps good evening. Uh, thanks for tuning in during these uh, historically unprecedented times. Uh, one of the few upsides of the pandemic has been global access to scientific talks, and I'm grateful to, to the organizers, um, and both Andrea and, and Tim, for inviting me to participate in this fantastic uh, seminar series. And as Andrew uh, mentioned, I, I just moved to Pittsburgh to start my own lab, and I arrived in June. And so today I'm going to discuss uh, published work in the first half of my talk and some exciting unpublished work in the second. So I'm concerned with the basic question, which is, how do we hear? On the left, we have activity from a cortical neuron which seems to respond to an auditory stimulus, and on the right is behavioral data from an auditory task. And arguably, the hard problem in systems neuroscience is connecting neurometrics to psychometrics. In other words, how do we know the responses in these cells are ultimately responsible for perception? So going all the way back to Hubel and Weasel, uh, in the seminal work, they found cells in primary visual cortex that have orientation uh, tuning. And the question is, do cells that have orientation tuning participate in the perception of oriented bars? Does the activity of these cells make us see visual gratings? So there are a lot of cells that don't have orientation tuning or have it to some analog degree. And the degree of tuning can vary randomly from trial to trial. And it's also plastic. But perceptually, we either see oriented gratings or we don't. And there are also many brain areas involved. What are their dynamics like? And this isn't just a problem for Hubel and Weasel. This is a problem for all systems neuroscientists. And we can ask the same question about the auditory system. Are neurons tuned to pure tones responsible for us hearing middle C? Does the tonotopic organization of primary auditory cortex do anything as far as actual perception goes? So we still don't have a clear answer to these questions. So, so what's required? So, and the classical view of the auditory system has been built from decades of experiments that anesthetize animals and passive listening conditions. And in this view, the primary auditory cortex provides a map of features of the auditory scene. And at the single cell level, uh, these are cells um, uh, that are highly tuned to a particular uh, frequency. So for example, um, on the, the lower left is a schematic of a classically responsive cell that reliably fires to a particular stimulus. And, and the field has uh, extensively studied these two neurons in sensory cortex. And this has contributed a great deal to our understanding of sensory processing um, and behavior. 
And as experimentalists started studying awake behaving animals, a more complex picture emerged of auditory cortex as a hub for perception. So in addition to representing sounds, classically responsive cells in auditory cortex are influenced by many behavioral factors, such as engagement, expectation, and locomotion, which compels us to consider auditory cortex in the context of other brain regions that provide these signals. But quite often, physiologists also encounter cells that are not classically responsive. So these cells do not fire in a task-related manner on average, and their responses are, are messy, highly variable, and challenging to interpret. And the potential contribution of these normally non-responsive cells to behavior remains to a large extent unknown. And I'm certainly not the first to point this out. Uh, Bruno Olshausen and David Field wrote an insightful chapter entitled, what is the other 85% of VO1 doing from the book 23 Problems in Systems Neuroscience that was published in 2005, referring to the analog of these cells and primary visual cortex. So just to give you a sense of how far reaching this question really is, uh, these normally non-responsive cells are not limited to rodent auditory cortex, but can be found in diverse brain regions, uh, including visual cortex, motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, parietal cortex, and subcortical areas like the hippocampus, as well as other species, including uh, C. elegans and monkeys, uh, spanning the, the phylogenetic tree. So these cells are especially prevalent in frontal cortical regions, uh, but can also be found in thalamic structures and primary sensory cortex. And in cortex, they can comprise up to 50 uh, to 70 percent of data sets that are typically neglected from analysis. And so the question is, have we been rightfully ignoring them, or does their activity contain hidden task information? So the, the prevalence of these non non-responsive neurons is reminiscent of the dark matter problem in physics. And the dark matter of the universe is the 85% uh, of matter that can be observed by its gravitational effects, but is otherwise invisible. And one of the, one of the largest um, problems in cosmology is understanding the nature of dark matter and where it comes from. And in the brain, I would argue, we have our own dark matter. The large number of, of these, um, these complex, normally non-responsive cells that have been observed, but not yet been integrated into our understanding of brain function. So just as the dark matter problem of physics pushes the field towards a deeper understanding of fundamental physical laws, the dark matter problem of neuroscience may, may yield new insights into the principles uh, governing brain function. So I would argue that systems neuroscience is finally in a position to confront this question and that the current trajectory of the field is towards understanding increasingly complex activity that's difficult to characterize. So if we consider cells along a continuum of increasing complexity, in addition to classically responsive cells, there are also cells that exhibit mixed selectivity. So these are individual cells that are modulated by multiple task parameters. And work from Stefano Fusi's group has demonstrated that mixed selectivity cells in primate BFC have computational advantages necessary for flexible behavior. And on the extreme end of the scale are these normally non-responsive cells that are so variable they fail to demonstrate any obvious trial average relationship to task parameters. So what's the potential benefit of having such diverse response profiles? So again, based on work from the FUSI lab, it could be that cells with complex responses confer flexibility to neural circuits by generating high dimensional representations that results in significant computational advantages for implementing adaptive behaviors. So how did we approach the problem of understanding non-classically responsive activity? So we started by recording from either auditory or frontal cortex during a go-no-go no go frequency recognition task where animals were trained to respond to a target tone for food reward and to withhold from responding uh, to non-target tones. And animals can learn this task within a few weeks and the right bottom panel shows the performance from 15 animals. And you can see that they have high hit rates, which correspond to correct responses to the four kilohertz target tone, and low false alarm rates, which correspond to uh, incorrect responses to the non-target tones. And there are two brain regions of interest for this behavior, which I'll examine uh, in parallel. Uh, auditory cortex, which I've already discussed. And moving downstream, a regional frontal cortex called FR2, 
which is directly connected to auditory cortex, responds to acoustic stimuli, and is involved in forming uh, categorical percepts. And this region has several aliases, such as secondary uh, motor cortex, or M2, frontal orienting fields, or FOF, and medial uh, acranular cortex. Um, furthermore, uh, bilateral mu small inactivation in either region impairs behavioral performance, suggesting that activity and, and age is necessary for this behavior. So once animals reach uh, behavioral criteria, we recorded extracellular uh, single unit activity from either auditory or frontal cortex during behavior using adjustable eight tetra arrays. So what types of response profiles did we observe? So we recorded classically responsive neurons in both regions. So here I'm showing an example, a power event raster and histogram of an auditory cortical cell that's responsive uh, to the target tone, which is represented by the peak um, in the histogram uh, when trials are aligned to stimulus onset. The same cell is also responsive to non-target tones. And the second archetype that we observed were ramping cells. So for example, this cell in frontal cortex has activity that increases before the animal's response. However, the majority of recorded cells had complex response profiles with no obvious structure over the course of the trial. So for example, this cell did not reliably uh, respond to target or non-target tones, nor did it display any ramping activity. And here, a cell is considered normally non-responsive when its trial activity is statistically indistinguishable from intra-trial baseline activity. And the majority of both cell, uh, the majority of cells in both regions were found to be normally non-responsive. And, and just to be clear, normally non-responsive cells are being uh, defined only in the context uh, of this particular task. This doesn't preclude the possibility that these cells can be driven by other stimuli or other task conditions. The question is, are they contributing in the context of this behavior? So what kind of approach is required for analyzing normally non-responsive cells? Well, first, we can't rely on structure and the trial averaged activity to suggest what role these cells play in behavior. There are no significant changes in the trial average firing rate where you might expect them. However, there may be features present in the spiking activity on individual trials that get averaged out in the firing rate. So we chose to use the interspike interval as a measure of spiking activity that may vary even when the trial average firing rate does not. Second, we require a unified approach since we're recording from sensory and frontal areas with very different response profiles. And third, downstream regions are only using single trial activity to generate behavior. And so we wanted our approach to do the same, which means decoding trial by trial. And in the same spirit as, as point three, we wanted to determine how much information about task variables is present using a model that made as few assumptions about one, how the brain uses trial activity, and two, how we model spiking activity. And so for these reasons, we did not rely on parametric models, such as a Poisson model, to describe the ISI distribution. We'll let the data uh, speak for itself. So with these desiderata in mind, uh, we developed a, a trial-by-trial ISI-based decoding algorithm for analyzing all recorded cells that includes every spike pair and every trial from every neuron, irrespective of their response profiles. So here's how our approach works. Uh, we first separate trials according to task parameter. In this case, uh, stimulus is shown with target trials in red and non-target trials in blue. And we look in each trial and build a library of all interspike intervals observed for each task condition. These libraries are then used to generate an assumption-free model of the ISI distribution given the stimulus using kernel density estimation. And the ISI in milliseconds is on the abscissa, and the probability of the ISI is on the ordinate axis. And what you'll notice is that these curves are very similar, but we can exploit their subtle differences to decode. So for example, for these ISIs, the red curve is above the blue curve, suggesting that um, these ISIs are more prevalent on target trials. And for the sharp eyes in the audience, uh, yes, the probability density can take values above one. It's the total area of the curve uh, under the curve that must be normalized. So now that we have the ISI distributions, they can be used as a likelihood function to decode a new spike train. So that's shown here on the bottom. And the vertical line depicts uh, the animal's behavioral response. 
And on this trial, the animal heard a target tone and made the appropriate motor response by nose poking. And the stimulus condition and upcoming choice are decoded by using each sequential ISI to adjust our beliefs about these variables using Bayes' rule. And the prediction of the neuron is assessed uh, at the end of the trial. Importantly, uh, the model's predictions were cross-validated, so we were never using the same data to generate and evaluate the model. So in case you're wondering about the biological plausibility of an ISI-based decoding scheme, if you're convinced that short-term plasticity like depression or facilitation could be useful for neural coding, it must be the case that cells are sensitive to subtle differences in the ISIs. Furthermore, uh, the intrinsic dynamics of cells can allow them to act as resonators that are tuned to particular ISIs. So here's the decoding performance for a single responsive cell reported in frontal cortex with stimulus decoding on the abscissa and choice uh, decoding on the ordinate. And you can see that this cell is multiplexed in that it encodes information about both stimulus category um, and choice simultaneously. So now examining all responsive cells with open circles representing auditory cortex, we find that task information was distributed across both brain regions and cells were often multiplexed. And when we include the non non-responsive cells shown in red, we can immediately see that they're task informative and multiplex at levels comparable to responsive cells. And keep in mind that this is single cell, single trial decoding from highly variable, sparsely firing cortical neurons, which means that we don't expect decoding performance to be very high for any given cell. And shown on the right is a control where we attempted to, to decode from spike trains generated by randomly sampling the ISIs from an entire session. And this fails as one would expect. So despite the, the broad sharing of information about behavioral conditions, there are notable uh, systematic differences between auditory cortex and frontal cortex. So there's a subtle yet statistically significant improvement in, in choice decoding um, in auditory cortex. And more dramatically, uh, frontal cortex is more informative about stimulus category than, than auditory cortex, a region we normally associate with stimulus representation. And you might be surprised by this, but it's possible that frontal cortex strongly represents test relevant information, whereas auditory cortex is more generally involved in representing the entire auditory scene. So we next asked if nominally non-responsive neurons are redundant. Uh, in other words, if we tried decoding without them, do we lose anything? And we found that nominally non-responsive neurons are not redundant, and including them improves decoding performance uh, beyond that of purely responsive ensembles. So going beyond single trials, I'm also interested in how uh, population activity represents behavioral variables. And our algorithm extends naturally to decoding populations of neurons if we allow each cell to simultaneously update the, algorithm, the algorithm's uh, predictions according to its own independently computed likelihood function. So here, uh, stimulus decoding performance is shown as a function of the number of cells in each ensemble. And we find that decoding performance in frontal cortex improves dramatically with just a few cells when compared with auditory cortex. And this is also true for choice decoding. Interestingly, uh, decoding performance uh, in frontal cortex asymptotes with only a few cells, suggesting that the information present in each, uh, in each cell is highly redundant. And auditory cortex dec uh, decoding doesn't improve as rapidly with increased uh, ensemble size, which may suggest a sparse or distributed coding scheme requiring many more cells to reach the same decoding performance as frontal cortex. So earlier I showed that nonlinear non responsive cells um, are, are as informative as responsive neurons, but how might they differ? So historically, uh, being able to predict behavioral errors using activity on single trials has been challenging, but we found that nonly non-responsive uh, neurons were error predictive. In other words, we were able to predict based on the neurons firing patterns that the animal was about to make a mistake. We also found that error prediction improves with the number of nonly non-responsive cells in an ensemble, suggesting that these cells might play a unique role in sensory uh, motor transformations. So I next wanted to know if this approach could be used to extract hidden task information from other uh, previously published data sets. So I applied our decoding algorithm to neurons that were identified 
as nominally, uh, as nominally non-responsive and, and excluded from um, the study by Chris Rogers and Ming Tuis. And in this study, uh, rats were trained on a novel auditory stimulus selection task where depending on the context, animals had to respond to one of two cues while ignoring the other. So rats were presented with two simultaneous sounds, uh, a white noise burst and a warble. And in the localization context, the animals were trained, uh, was trained to ignore the warble and respond to the location of the white noise burst. And in the pitch context, it was trained to ignore the location of the white uh, noise burst and respond to the pitch of the warble. And the authors found that the pre-stimulus activity in both primary auditory cortex and prefrontal cortex encodes the selection rule. That is that the, the firing rate reflects whether the animal is in the localization or pitch context. Um, but their conclusion was entirely based on the activity of responsive cells. So using our approach, we found that nominally non-responsive neurons encoded the selection rule, often with greater fidelity than responsive neurons. I'm demonstrating that in addition to encoding stimulus and choice, these neurons can also reflect abstract uh, cognitive variables and might play a, a privileged role in, in rule encoding. So in summary, uh, we can uncover hidden task information from nonly non-responsive cells using a, a, a novel uh, general purpose single trial decoding algorithm that can be applied to any brain area and any behavioral task. And I've also demonstrated that not only non-responsive cells may be doing something interesting and different from responsive neurons. So in the first part of my talk, I showed you that there are all these neurons in the brain that appear to be non-responsive. Where do these responses come from? So they seem like they're important or potentially important for network function, but how can we test this? And I've thought very deeply about how to do this experimentally. Um, but even with our state-of-the-art tools, these circuit dissection experiments are complicated to interpret. So I want to go into them with some intuition for how to think about the network dynamics. And, and with that in mind, um, our computational techniques have reached the point where we can start rigorously testing these ideas in silico. So we can start there and then use the hypotheses we generate to feed back into the experimental work. So for now, we're going to turn to artificial uh, neural network simulations to address the following questions. Where do these responses come from? Are these responses important for network function? And what are their specific network parameters that the responses are sensitive to? So this is, this is all unpublished work and a work in progress, so I won't have complete answers to all of these questions in this talk, but we do have some interesting results to share. So we're going to build a, a spiking uh, neural network because based on our previous work, we believe that spike timing is important. And we're interested in what biological plasticity mechanisms may be responsible for the formation of these response profiles. So we're going to build a spiking network that one, can perform our task, and two, uses experimentally motivated plasticity rules. So in our case, we're going to focus on spike timing dependent plasticity, or SDP, which has been extensively studied as an activity dependent mechanism for long term synaptic change. And because we believe these neural responses might be shaped by, by these, plastic, these synaptic plasticity rules. And I should mention that we're developing this network at a special time in our current neural network history. There are a number of different groups interested in creating models that include various combinations of these features, including work by Tim Vogels on um, inhibitory to excitatory plasticity, which, which and, uh, and other forms of, of SDP, which plays an important role in, in our model. And, and this um, previous work has really allowed us to swoop in and put all these pieces together to create a new class of models. So creating something like this takes a village, and here are the people that help make this happen. Uh, the modeling work that I'm about to present was done in collaboration with Better Albena, faculty here at Pitt, a new member of my lab, Jack Toth, uh, Kanika Rajan, currently faculty at Mount Sinai, and Brian De Pasquale, uh, currently a post, he's currently a postdoc at Princeton working with Carlos Brody and Jonathan Pillow. Okay, so let's talk about the network architecture. So the network is uh, comprised of 1,000 uh, leaky integrated and fire neurons, 800 excitatory and 200 inhibitory. The neurons uh, obey Diehl's law, meaning that uh, they're exclusively excitatory or inhibitory. 
each neuron synapses on another randomly with a 5% probability, and weights are initialized randomly around the mean value. A quarter of the excitatory neurons uh, receive external inputs that will serve as the stimulus, and uh, the remaining three quarters of excitatory neurons are output neurons, which project to an output unit uh, through a distinct set of output weights. And the inhibitory neurons don't receive inputs or project outputs, but are currently connected to the rest of the network. And different subsets of excitatory input neurons receive a fixed current, depending on which uh, frequency is played. And the network is trained so that on target trials, it produces elevated activity in the output unit after tone presentation. And on non-target trials, the network remains at baseline. And I'll show examples of that later. So in general, uh, we focused on excitatory to excitatory and inhibitory to, ex to excitatory plasticity as motivated by the experimental literature. And for E to E, we're using a classical pairwise SCDP rule. So that's standard Hebbian plasticity from the and Fu and Zong and Abbott, where LTP occurs when postsynaptic spikes follow presynaptic spikes, and LTD occurs when postsynaptic spikes precede presynaptic spikes. Our ITE mechanism is based on uh, Bogles et al. and Damore and Frumpke et al. And synapses are strengthened or experience LTP when pre and post synaptic cells fire asynchronously um, and weakened or experience uh, LTD when they fire asynchronously, regardless of order. So we also included two uh, local non Hebbian plasticity mechanisms modified from Zenku and Gerstner that act on the same time scale as SCDP. So a form of heterosynaptic depression, which prevents any one weight on a postsynaptic cell from dominating, combined with uh, a mechanism to, to boost weights, which have become too weak. So to train our, uh, our network, we used a method that could operate in parallel with SCDP's modification of the recurrent weights. And specifically, we modified a version of force training designed for spiking neural networks. And in its original form, uh, force trains a randomly connected uh, chaotic recurrent neural network to produce arbitrary behavior with, with fixed recurrent weights. And we were able to get it working in a spiking neural network uh, where the recurrent weights are modified. So essentially, our model implements the two plasticity mechanisms um, in parallel. So force training is modifying the output weights to harness network activity to complete the go-no-go no go task. And SCDP is modifying the internal weights as a function of only uh, the activity of units in the network, not task demands. And the challenge here is getting both of these pieces to work together without making the network uh, behavior pathological. And this, this is really where the ingenuity and creativity of uh, Better and Kanika has really come into play. And, and remarkably, both of these mechanisms can operate in parallel without disrupting each other. And moreover, we're already seeing some interesting indications that combined they can have a synergistic positive effect on, on trained network behavior. So the first question is, can we get the network to perform our task? And as I've already mentioned, there's obviously no guarantee that force learning would be compatible with SCDP, but we found that it is. In fact, we can still train our network successfully over a wide range of SCDP parameters. And here are two example um, output unit responses. And you can see on the left, a target trial is, uh, is played. And you can see that the output unit activity uh, rises following uh, the stimulus during the response period. And on the right, is a correct uh, reject where uh, the output unit stays at baseline uh, in response to a non-target tone. So on the left are some example uh, voltage traces with inhibitory and excitatory currents from single units uh, in our network. And here are some example rasters and the firing rate histograms. And these are the population statistics for three example networks. Um, they're entirely consistent with our in vivo observations with roughly 40 to 50% of normally non uh, responsive units and 50 to 60% responsive units. And what's interesting here is that these response profiles emerge from standard excitatory and inhibitory um, plasticity. They, they just fall out of this form of SCDP that the field has been describing for, for the past 10 years. <clears throat> 
So now that we can generate uh, these different response types, we wondered if our network units encoded task information um, just as we had pre uh, previously observed in, in vivo. So using the, the exact same single trial ISI-based non-parametric Bayesian decoder, we found that both responsive and non non-responsive uh, units encode task information. So here I'm showing you all units with significant information uh, for one uh, example network. And the decoding performance for both groups is comparable um, to what we found in vivo. So just as a reminder, uh, decoding performance uh, is, is evaluated using tenfold cross-validation. And, and decoding is considered significant relative to control where uh, observed ISIs are shuffled across groups. So we next wondered uh, if these units contribute to task performance. Uh, in other words, what would happen if we silence them? So to do that, we performed uh, some in silico perturbation experiments uh, by, by inactivating a random subset of either uh, responsive or non-responsive units. And we, we find that inactivating either po uh, population impairs task performance, suggesting that um, both subpopulations are important for network uh, behavior. And this is consistent uh, with other work looking at deep learning networks, uh, which has shown that inactivating uh, non-selective units has a significant impact on performance, just as we're seeing here. So what might cause this impairment uh, in performance following an activation? Do normally non-responsive units contribute to network performance only through their recurrent connections to responsive cells, their direct influence on output unit activity, or, or both? So to answer that, uh, we first, or to try to answer that, we first checked uh, that train networks uh, contain output weights from normally non-responsive units as well as responsive ones. And here I'm plotting the distribution of, of output weights for uh, responsive and non-responsive units. Before training, uh, these weights were are, are set very close to zero, but after training, the distributions are, are similar and both contain a significant uh, number of non-zero values, suggesting that both responsive and non-responsive units are, are directly involved in generating the output units behavior. And of course, the, the existence of these weights alone doesn't establish that they're required. So we're currently running an, uh, um, an, an activation experiment, which leaves the units themselves unperturbed, but selectively removes the output weights from each unit type. Similarly, we're inactivating the recurrent weights, uh, but, but leaving the output uh, weights undisturbed to see whether or not uh, it's the influence on other units uh, that's significant. So, so, so far I've shown you that we can uh, recapitulate uh, what we've seen in vivo in a spiking uh, network model uh, with these interesting SDP rules. But now the question is how sensitive are these response profiles to the details of the model? What effect does STDB have on network performance and population statistics? So we compared the performance of networks uh, before STDP was applied to their performance after. And the main distinction here is that in the pre-SCBP networks, the recurrent weights are fixed during training, whereas in the post-SCBP case, uh, they evolve according to the standard SCBP rules that I described. So we found that SCBP uh, improved performance for all uh, four trained networks. And, and I just want to add that if you're coming uh, from a more biological perspective where you view SCBP as an evolutionarily adaptive mechanism for supporting learning and behavior, it might seem natural that SCBP should help. Um, however, if you take the perspective of a network modeler, SCDP is only making the learning process more difficult. So force is trying to learn to perform the task by mining the underlying behavior of the recurrent neural network, but SCDP is constantly causing that behavior to change under the feet of the learning algorithm. So nothing about how SCDP is designed is optimized a priori for the task. So there's no re reason to believe that SCDP should trivially uh, improve performance. So let's try uh, unpacking this a little bit by selectively turning on our SCDP mechanisms. So now, instead of simply turning on all SCDP mechanisms were only turn them on uh, one at a time. 
So selectively enabling uh, excitatory to excitatory plasticity reproduces the same booster performance we see in the fully enabled SDVP networks. And selectively enabling inhibitory to excitatory plasticity does not seem to boost performance per se, but it does lead to more variability in the outcome. So what about uh, population statistics? So it appears that the percentage of responsive to normally non-responsive units is highly sensitive to E to E plasticity. And more specifically, E to E plasticity both uh, boosts behavioral performance and the percentage of normally non-responsive units. So we're currently um, working on understanding how sensitive th these, response, uh, these responses are to the details of the model, such as you know, network size and architecture, the ratio of excitatory to inhibitory units, the formulation of the SCDP rules, um, what are the critical points? And, and so looking at uh, the synaptic inputs will help us understand how these different response profiles emerge and function uh, in the network. How are they connected to the rest of the network? What about a neuron's inputs determines its response types? Is it the configuration of the weights? Is it the identity of the cells that it's listening to? Is it something more subtle? So one hypothesis is that nonlinear non-responsive units are weakly coupled to the rest of the network. Perhaps these, unit, uh, these neurons um, randomly began with weaker inputs and remain uh, that way during training. Or an alternative is that normally non-responsive cells uh, receive a precise balance of excitation and in inhibition, uh, which prevents uh, uh, significant changes in the overall firing rate. And part of the motivation for using simulations in the first place was that we can pop the hood on the model, look at the synaptic inputs to large populations of neurons, and make strong predictions about what we might to, uh, what we might expect to see in vivo. So, in addition to addressing these questions using network modeling, we we have the ability to address it using actual neural data. So, I did some patching experiments uh, where I made wholesale recordings while animals performed a go/no-go -no -go frequency recognition task. And this method was developed by uh, Kishore Kuchibotla while he was a postdoc in Rob's lab and involves implanting uh, a cranial window with a small access hole for, for a patch electrode, which provides uh, sufficient uh, stability for whole cell recordings. And for some cells, I was able to record uh, cell attached spiking activity and then break in to record inputs. So this allows us to both directly identify responsive versus non like non-responsive neurons and measure the synaptic inputs that produce that response type. And we're really excited uh, about these recordings because it'll also give us a very detailed data set that we can uh, benchmark our uh, network model against. And the idea here is to gain some confidence uh, in our model's predictions before jumping into some detailed uh, circuit dissection experiments in vivo. So I, I just wanted to you know, take uh, a few minutes uh, to describe some uh, additional questions that my lab is pursuing. And as I, as I mentioned previously, I recently started my own lab at the University of, of Pittsburgh, and we're interested in studying perceptual flexibility, namely, how do flexible circuits emerge during auditory learning, and what might the diversity of neural response types uh, contribute? So for, exam uh, for example, as we've all experienced, sounds encountered in daily life are, are really neutral. So a honking horn while stuck in traffic may barely be noticed, uh, but one heard while crossing the street might call your attention. So even in subtle ways, auditory perception is flexibly gated by the contextual relevance of sounds. And flexible behavior is observed um, at all levels of the phylogenetic tree. And, and given how widespread um, flexible behavior is across many species, we would expect to see uh, hallmarks of flexibility in neural circuits, even as the specific uh, circuit implementations change. So at, as a postdoc, um, I, I had collaborated with neural engineers who spend all of their time worrying about how to build flexible arrays that can um, that can conform uh, to the surface of a highly folded cerebral, uh, cerebral cortex. So this is a, is a non-trivial problem. So these, um, these arrays are composed of long polymers 
with strong, uh, rigid internal connections. Uh, but the flexibility of the circuit is a result of the many tenuous and fluid connections between polymers. And this picture provides a useful uh, analogy for thinking about flexibility more generally. It results from the balance between strong internal links of the polymer and the fluid links uh, between polymers. And so with this analogy in mind, what are the neural signatures of flexibility in the brain? What aspects are flexible in these circuits? When and where does flexibility emerge in the network? Are there some cells that are more flexible than others? Or does the network as a whole reconfigure dynamically based on task demands? Is flexibility itself a property that can come and go, say, metaflexibility? So what might an inflexible, an inflexible circuit look like? So elements of this circuit would respond with large signal to noise ratios tightly locked to circuit inputs and outputs. From a, from a signal uh, detection theory perspective, the network acts as a channel which transforms the inputs to behavioral outcomes. On the other hand, a flexible circuit would require cells that are more fluidly connected to the demands of any particular task, allowing the network to reconfigure easily. And from a dynamical systems perspective, Diverse neural ensembles, which include cells with com uh, complex response profiles, such as normally non-responsive cells and, and mixed selectivity cells, may reflect that the system is in a critical state where small perturbations, such as task-relevant sensory input or internal state, can lead to drastically different network behavior. So we're currently uh, working on training animals on an auditory reversal uh, learning task where they first learn to respond to a particular tone, and then we implement a rule switch and change which tone is being rewarded. So animals understand the rules of the game, but they now have to remap stimulus reward contingencies. And we're now using uh, silicon probes to monitor spiking activity from large populations of neurons in a temporal frontal network during learning, because we think exploring population dynamics will be important for understanding how animals learn. And I'm currently recruiting postdocs and technicians, so if anyone's at all interested in anything they just heard, please reach out to me. And finally, um, I'd like to thank my lab, this is, this is arguably the most important slide, uh, Trisha uh, Gupta, an, an undergraduate I worked with while I was at NYU who followed me to Pitt to become my first lab technician and helped me set up the lab this summer, uh, Jack Toth, who's currently working on, on the modeling, uh, Dan Saeed and Dylan uh, Leonard, who are working on the reversal learning experiments, my collaborators, uh, Better, Kanika, and Brian, for their help with the modeling, and, and finally, my postdoctoral advisor, uh, Rob, uh, Rob Frumke, for his uh, consistent and unending support and guidance, and Saba and, and Maddie for their help with the mouse behavioral training. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my funding sources and, and thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Um, uh, I'm sure we're all we're all clapping. Unfortunately, I, I can't be the only one who will get to uh, um, volubly clap. But uh, thank you very much for uh, the talk. And we have a few questions here. Again, I invite you to add your questions to this list. Click on the Ask a Question button to do that. Um, all right, so first up, uh, B and Poo observed the classical STDP curve from CA1 cultured neurons in high calcium ACSF and at room temperature. Do you account for these experimental parameters in your models somehow? Not at the moment. Uh, so let me just go, I, I think it might be instructive to go back. Uh, to this slide. I think that, you know, the, the reason, I mean, just to, to be clear about um, why, you know, we, we chose this, this rule because it's, you know, it's 
it's arguably like a, the classical sort of standard pairwise SCDP rule, right? And and yes, it may it may have been um, originally discovered in uh, in this uh, well, let's say highly uh, re reductive um, preparation, but it has it has been recapitulated and um, uh, uh, replicated in in other uh, preparation. So I'm, I'm that, that aspect of this doesn't concern me. That said, um, we are interested in figuring out, um, you know, what, what, uh, the details of these, uh, various SCP mechanisms and, you know, what happens when we change this window slightly. Um, so while I would argue that, you know, we're, we're very much inspired and, and, um, modeling uh, this very specific uh, rule that uh, we're also interested in exploring uh, the various details of these rules and we can we can alter that in, in our model right there I mean there are many uh, knobs that that we can turn to uh, to um, sort of explore how these different uh, plasticity rules are uh, producing uh, these the, these different uh, response profiles, and so um, that's something that we we can actually test. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, okay, next up from Alberto Antonietti, we have um, I have a question about the recurrent neural network. Did you only try one thousand neurons, or did you also explore different sizes of the neural network? Did you notice or do you expect differences in performance, for example, bigger networks learning more robustly? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question. So we started with 1,000 neurons. We would like to increase uh, the overall um, size of, of the network um, to, to test uh, exactly uh, the point that, that you raised. Um, we're hoping we can push it to about 10,000 neurons. We'll, we'll see um, what, what we can accomplish there. But that, that is something we're very um, actively interested um, in pursuing. And you, know, you can imagine that with, um, well, one argument is that with larger, with a larger N, you might be able to create enough uh, a variance in the model that, that um, it, it that drives this kind of like robustness that um, that you mentioned, and it it might be um, it might it could be the case that larger um, uh, that uh, you know a, a model with a, a larger uh, number of neurons could uh, sort of generate um, a rich set of dynamics for for maybe properly uh, exploring these different plasticity rules. So there, there's another argument. That um, perhaps it won't it won't matter at, at all, and that this will will, will only scale. Um, so we'll we'll find out. Great. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it maybe a quick follow up on that. Um, the uh, mixed selectivity idea and the idea of having neurons doing lots of different things so that it promotes flexibility. It does promote flexibility, but Seems like the flip side of that is sort of noise stability, which is even small differences might be amplified into very different neural representations. Um, have you looked at explicitly injecting noise in any of these networks? Yes. Um, uh, yes, and I had I had a slide on this. Um, I think one of one of uh, so I think better actually tried doing these experiments and. Better might be in the, in, in the, the chat area uh, right now. I can probably probably better address this. But what I remember uh, us trying is injecting uh, noise in the inputs, and we found. I think we tested this with and without SCDP. And if I remember correctly, um, SCDP provides some resilience to that noise. Um, now that's something that I, I'd like to uh, follow up on, and it's it's highly uh, preliminary, so don't hold me to it. But that's um, that is something that that we're seeing in terms of um, what SCDP could could be contributing in terms of constraining the, the network a, a little bit better. Great. Um, it looks like Batter is actually here. Um, 
Do you want to come up on screen? Yeah. Maybe. Just wait for him to confirm before I. All right, let's see if it works. Hello. Great, we can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, I actually, I don't have too much to add, but I just wanted to clarify. So yeah, we did try a version of this experiment. I think part of the reason uh, Michelle opted not to include it is it was a slightly older version of the network with a slightly different default. So we didn't wanna present it alongside these other results and, and pretend that we're all talking about the same thing. But in those versions, um, we injected two types of noise. So, so uh, the input neurons, the way they're receiving the input is, is essentially a tonotopic input, sort of like what AC would do. So depending on which tone you're hearing, a different subset of neurons is receiving a, a current pulse. And so we tried two types of noise, one where that standard level of current has some noise attached to it, and one where the input neurons, uh, which neurons get stimulated, uh, has some noise attached to it. And in both cases, Michelle is right. For those, for those set of parameters, um, the STDP neuron, so all, all, in both cases, performance was degraded, but the STDP train networks demonstrated more resilience to that noise. So performance stayed higher, particularly at the high noise level. So at the high, very high noise levels where, um, at least for me, and Michelle, you can chime in if you feel the same way, the most shocking result for that particular network is that at the high noise levels, when you're stimulating, you know, half the neurons are stimulating are the proper set and the other half are just random other input neurons. Um, the STDP train networks could still perform reasonably well sort of by, by animal behavioral standards, maybe not by recurrent neural network behavioral standards. Um, so we're, we're gonna, we're definitely gonna explore that some more, but um, yeah, as Michelle said, don't don't hold us to that if that turns out not to be a robust result, but that's, that's the preliminary result anyway. Interesting, great, thank you. Um, all right, uh, and from Tim Vogels, we have, can you say a little bit more about the effects of your various plasticity rules and how they work together? Are they all crucial? What is the intuition for why STDP improves the performance of force? And I guess I can I can release battery. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what? Okay. So the question again is sorry. I can't. Um, I, so the, the question is some intuition for how these different uh, rules are are connected and how they play. Yeah. Um. So, okay, I'll just pull up this uh, slide one more time. I think it could be uh, instructive. So that's what we're trying to understand, Tim. So, um, you know, when, when we're doing these experiments where, where we're adding uh, SCDP, well, I just wanted, you know, in, in terms of what's going on in, in this figure and some intuition and motivation for this experiment, we, we had, no idea if SDP was actually doing any anything useful in terms of um, helping the behavior. So here um, was our sort of first pass uh, attempt at evaluating. Um, you know, we, we threw all these SDP rules into this model, and, and it re recapitulates you know what we see uh, in vivo, but but it wasn't clear to us that it, it should necessarily um, improve performance. And so um, I think it's interesting that that it does. And I, um, the, the next step for us was to sort of unpack that a little bit, right? So, so what happens when we only um, enable uh, E to E or, or I to E? And what's interesting here is that it seems like um, for, for in, in the case of excitatory, to excitatory plasticity, that's really uh, doing most of the work. Um, it's not clear at the moment um, what role uh, IDE is playing here, other, you know, other than uh, sort of introducing um, a lot of uh, variability into the behavioral um, performance and um, you know, one speculative interpretation is that the IDE plasticity is injecting some uncertainty into the learning process, and in, in, in some way, that may not be particularly helpful 
for, for learning um, a single task, but that might be useful when, when trying to train a network on, on multiple tasks. And, and so um, what we also find uh, fascinating is that, you know, that, that, that E to E term is um, not only um, improving performance, but it, but it also um, causes a reconfiguration of uh, responsive and only non-responsive uh, units. And um, so this is, there's still like a lot of work uh, that remains to be done here, but um, maybe we can, you can discuss uh, a little bit more um, offline. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear uh, your, your thoughts uh, in, in terms of what, what you think could be, could be happening uh, here. And, and what we might want to explore a little bit further. And you still owe me a bottle of champagne because we showed that we could decode with the ISI, so I'm holding you to that. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, I guess maybe there's no real, uh, you sort of answered this, but I'll just put out the uh, last piece of uh, Tim's question was, do you have any intuition for what the E, e to E you know, what are you getting out of STDP in terms of um, its behavior here? In terms of what the network is doing at a finer grade level? I mean, you show it, it improves things, but is there any sense of what exactly is different in the learned solution? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we, we really need to unpack. And, you know, we're going to start looking at things like the, um, uh, you know, the, the weight distributions um, in these uh, synapses, um, and that's that's something that we're, we're going to lean uh, heavily on on Kanika for because she she's um, uh, sort of a, an, an expert in exploring those um, dynamics. But that is that is uh, sort of on the horizon. We don't we don't yet know. Um, so get it, you know, getting a handle on the configuration of the weights um, and perhaps how the connectivity might might be uh, changing when we um, enable these different plasticity rules, I think it's going to become um, essential and is something that we're actively uh, exploring. So sorry, I don't have I don't have a good answer to that question um, um, yet, but but maybe in, in a month or so we will. Yeah, it's very intriguing. Um, maybe one final question before we move to the uh, Zoom discussion, which I put the link in the chat just a little bit before, if you're uh, interested in joining for that. Um, I'm wondering about how your, um, how, I, I guess it seems like, it seems to me there's a challenge in interpreting these inactivation experiments because uh, it could be that uh, the, the ISI decoding is not something that uh, the trained network decoder is in fact using to, to make its decision. And it could be more about the operating set point of the network. So have you tried any experiments where you sort of maintain the weights from these nominally non-responsive neurons, but you, you decouple them from the network and just have them spike at the background Poisson rate that they, they have or something like this? Or yeah, yeah. Um, I, I. So there, there are many different ways to to perform an inactivation experiment. Um, and so our our, you know, we the first the first thing we wanted to try was well, what happens if we just completely silence them, right? We really took a sledgehammer approach, um, and and that was just because we um, we wanted to to get a, a sense of, well, if you, you know, basically take them out of, of the network, uh, what does it change? And then we'll, we'll do these sort of more um, fine-grained uh, analyses where we uh, maybe just weaken the weights and um, uh, we can we can then look at its, its role uh, in the behavioral performance and um, and how it's affecting uh, the different population statistics, but that that is also um, a, an experiment that we we are planning um, to do because it it might be uh, I think a little bit more um, 
I think it's a bit of a, a more nuanced uh, way of addressing the functional contributions of these different um, cell types um, and, and might and, and might actually yield some some insight in, into how they're they're functioning um, in this network. So I, I agree that um, there there are many different ways in, in, in which to to inactivate and, and perturb, and um, that that's something we're certainly interested in doing. Great. We just have one more question come in, so let, let's do it uh, before we close. Um, this is from Yuri Rodriguez. Do you think that STDP is relevant to understanding behavior? There are a uh, few studies on in vivo STDP results. And uh, also he notes that um, for irregular spikes, similar to those seen in vivo, the classical STDP shape as we know it does not hold very well. I, I think that, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, new uh, experimental evidence um, emerging that you know there's sort of there's classical SDP, but then there's there's um, uh, SDP rules uh, that might be shaped by other factors such as you know, neuromodul uh, neuromodulatory signals and um, etc. Right? I mean, there's this, this um, a recent uh, review on on this that was just published, but um, I guess that the way I I view this is that um, we know that these neurons are um, informative in terms of their spike times, right? So we when you decode with their spike times, um, this is something that uh, these these neurons are very sensitive to. And, and the spike times are highly, highly informative. So, you know, knowing that spike timing is important, um, you know, if, if you, if, you know, you think that uh, synaptic depression or, or facilitation uh, could, be, could be useful, then, you know, it sort of has to be the case that these, these neurons use their, their ISIs. And so, you know, one of, you know, I would, I would argue that, um, SCDP allows us to, uh, it, it gives us a, a potential handle uh, on to what to model because, you know, then the question, like, I'm really interested in understanding the brain. So, you know, our, our, our ultimate goal is to understand how responsive and normally non-responsive neurons are produced, right? And, and we believe that synaptic plasticity might actually play a role in, in shaping uh, the variety of neural response profiles, whether it's SCDP per se, well, you know, modeling this uh, using an RNN is a way to actually uh, tease that apart and figuring out what, in terms of figuring out what it's doing, it's very hard um, to do these kinds of experiments in, in vivo, right? You can't look at every single uh, uh, at, at least at the moment, every single synapse and, and, and measure its synaptic input. And I think, you know, one important uh, goal or, or purpose of this entire um, exercise and this entire uh, project that, that we're doing is to understand uh, the role of SVP and, and what potential role it could be playing in, in, in learning. So that's, that's the goal. Great. That's a, a good note to end on. Uh, thank you again for your talk. And uh, I'll see those of you who want to join us in the Zoom discussion room. Feel free to take a couple minutes to you know, grab a coffee. And uh, we'll see you all there. Thanks a lot. Thank you.